For many, many years now, militaries have been relying on these same basic families of systems for a lot of their offensive firepower. Projectiles, whether they be bombs, bullets, or missiles, have improved significantly. Whether that's meant becoming longer-ranged, more agile, more precise, more destructive, or just safer to store. And for the most part, they very much do the jobs they were designed to do. But just because nations have a system that works, doesn't mean it works perfectly or they aren't looking for something better. For decades now, the military pursuit of a new generation of destructive, responsive, and potentially more affordable weapon systems has led governments to plow billions of dollars into researching what, to the public at least, might seem like sci-fi next-generation technologies. These are directed energy weapons, most commonly, lasers and high-powered microwaves. On paper, these technologies have enormous potential advantages over more conventional weapons. But with years of development and research having yielded only a handful of operational systems, there's probably value in asking the question, where do directed energy weapons sit on the spectrum between the future of weapons development and expensive science project? And as they do begin to be fielded in greater numbers, how should we expect militaries to use them? So to do that, we're going to follow a pretty familiar pattern, starting with the history of directed energy weapons, what their basic characteristics are and promise to do, run through some of the programs we have publicly heard about in the land, sea, and aerospace domains, and then having hyped up the potential of these sci-fi weapon systems, we'll of course throw cold water on the whole thing by looking at potential countermeasures and risks. In the interest of time though, I've got two main caveats. Firstly, that I'll be focusing mostly on destructive systems, and secondly, that I'm going to focus on anti-materiel, not anti-personnel systems. Those tend to look and be used very differently, and so are probably a topic for another day. But before we start working through a light speed topic at very much sub-light velocities, quick word from a sponsor. And today, I'm once again welcoming back a returning sponsor and my VPN of choice, Private Internet Access. When it comes to mitigating almost any sort of risk, often part of the solution is going to be layering various protections. We've talked about the survivability onion when it comes to military vehicles, where ideally you probably don't want to be depending just on your armor plate or an active protection system, but also things like camouflage, positioning, and maneuver that help you avoid being seen or engaged in the first place. When it comes to protecting your privacy online, there might be something to be said for a similarly layered approach. You probably want to watch where you browse, what you click, what passwords you use, and then you might want to add a VPN. With a click, a VPN can allow you to do things like reroute your internet traffic, change your publicly perceived IP address, and potentially change how your traffic is logged. With that last one being particularly relevant, because it's kind of hard to compromise data that doesn't exist, and private internet access has a stated policy of not logging user activity, which has reportedly been both tested in court and subject to audit. Plus, when you do go to Connect, you'll find they have servers in more than 91 countries, and dedicated hubs in locations like Brussels and Silicon Valley. Or with a system that's advertised as being compatible with a range of streaming services, available cross-platform, and critically, if you're someone like me with more than a couple of devices on the go, allows you to cover an unlimited number of devices with a single subscription. So if you're interested, there will be a link in the description, which will give you access to an 83% discount on a two-year subscription, plus four bonus months, covering an unlimited number of devices. And for some of you listening, the deal might be even better than that. Because if you're working as a journalist with a charity or NGO in an area where digital privacy might be at risk, you might be eligible to access a free subscription through their privacy pass. So if you're interested, feel free to check it out. And with my thanks, back to the episode. Okay, so let's start, as we often do, with a little bit of history. As far as we can tell, for basically all of human history, people have overwhelmingly relied on kinetic weapons for ranged combat. These are weapons where you transmit energy, where you inflict damage on a target by imparting energy into an object and accelerating it towards the thing that you want to be hurt. In perhaps its most basic configuration, a thrown rock is a ranged kinetic weapon. Robbo wants to punch a bloke 10 meters away on the other side of a stream or a river, but lacking 10 meter long arms or a desire to swim, he can't do so. So instead of transmitting energy by throwing a punch, he picks up a rock, throws it, imparting the energy to the rock, and assuming the rock then hits its target, the energy has been retransmitted and potentially damage done. Over the years, humanity has come up with a huge number of ways and configurations in which this basic principle can be applied. We've come up with different methods of accelerating things from mechanical levers and catapults through to detonating gunpowder behind a projectile inside a tube, or employing systems like rockets or railguns. We've also come up with all manner of things that you can accelerate, from bullets to fragmentation out of an artillery shell or hand grenade, through to warheads that use an explosive detonation to accelerate a stream of molten metal towards the desired target. But the basic principle is everywhere, to the point where one euphemism for the stage of a fight where you actually start bombing, shooting, or inflicting physical damage on your opponent somehow is going kinetic or taking kinetic action. 
An energy weapon, by contrast, to use a simplified definition for this video, dispenses with the projectile. Instead of imparting energy into a target by accelerating something else first, you just find a way to beam or transmit that energy directly. Not all concepts for doing that are entirely modern. Whether or not it actually existed, for example, the concept of Archimedes using polished mirrors to focus the sun's rays in order to set ships on fire would basically have been a directed energy weapon, and would have meant that in a way, the sun was in fact a deadly laser. But for the purpose of this video, we're mostly concerned with some technologies that came along much later, and which form the basis for a lot of the modern thought around the potential of directed energy. These, of course, being the laser and the high-powered microwave. Now, I thought long and hard about it, but in the interest of time in this episode, I'm not really going to dive too much into the science of how high-powered microwaves and laser weapons work. Instead, I want to focus on their characteristics as weapon systems. What can they do? What are their strengths and weaknesses? And what sort of implications does that have for the future of warfare and force design? For now, it's enough to say that both types of systems use concentrated electromagnetic energy, not kinetic energy, to do damage to targets. But because one is, unsurprisingly given the name, emitting a laser and the other a microwave, the way they perform and act on targets can be very different. A laser weapon transmits energy into a target using a beam of coherent light. How exactly the laser generates that beam, what wavelength it operates in, and a variety of other factors can be incredibly diverse across different designs. You have lasers powered by chemical reactions, electrical power, or during humanity's less sober moments, nuclear explosions. But in a destructive military weapon context, what you will almost inevitably get, no matter how it is generated, is a concentrated beam of electromagnetic energy that's going to move at the speed of light and apply potentially a lot of particularly thermal energy, heat, to a point target. So if you are talking about damaging a system using a laser and the target is not something vulnerable to light, like optics or the human eye, how resistant it is to thermal energy is probably going to be your second question. So to be very clear, this thing that fires a visible red bolt, which moves slower than a bullet across a screen and then explodes when it hits something, is not a laser. The so-called Death Star Super Laser, with its slower-than-light energy beams, is also probably not a laser. And whether this thing is a laser weapon, particle weapon, flashlight, or funeral prop ultimately depends on the source material in question. The other type of technology we'll be looking at today is the high-powered microwave. And while this might be another directed energy weapon, the way it behaves compared to a laser is pretty chalk and cheese. As the name suggests, you're using microwaves to transmit energy, not coherent light. You're often going to be hitting a wider physical area as opposed to a narrow point target, as a laser does. Meaning that potentially, while a laser might operate like a laser pointer, a high-powered microwave weapon can be more like waving a torch into the sky. And then beyond that, the method a HPM uses to deliver damage to a target is also fundamentally different. A laser is going to impart thermal energy to a target. It's going to burn it. But the target for most high-powered microwaves, when they aren't being used on squishy targets like personnel, is actually usually going to be a target's electronics. Particularly if you choose to attack on the correct frequency, a microwave is going to potentially dump a lot of energy into a target's electronic components. That, in turn, can degrade or destroy them. If you target a building full of sensitive computer systems with a HPM on the right settings, then that building might show zero signs of damage from the attack, but the computers inside might be so badly screwed that it makes the old Xbox Red Ring of Death look like a minor error. We'll go into a little more detail about how these technologies work as weapon systems a little later on, but for now, let's jump back to the Cold War and the arrival of the first military lasers. During the Cold War, lasers were rapidly adopted for a wide range of uses. Laser sights and guidance systems were developed, and of course, laser rangefinders made life a whole lot easier for gunners and a whole lot harder for targets. But militaries being militaries, there was also a lot of interest in taking the new technology and using it to destroy things directly. To that end, we did actually see dedicated laser-armed vehicles during the Cold War. With one of the more famous examples being the Soviet 1K17, which you can genuinely argue was the world's first laser tank. These vehicles, of which I believe only two ever existed, were reportedly intended to disrupt or disable enemy optical electronic equipment through the basic mechanism of focusing a high-powered laser at them. Because of the technological limits of the time, however, the result seems to have been very much a solution searching for a problem. Power generation limits meant a potentially constrained range, and the fact that you needed basically a tank-sized system to potentially just disable your enemy's optical equipment, as opposed to, you know, taking a tank-sized system like a tank and using it to just knock out enemy vehicles or positions entirely. Because blowing up an enemy vehicle is also a fairly reliable way of disabling their optics. The vehicle would also likely be very expensive to manufacture. Fortunately, the Soviet Union wasn't having any economic problems at all in the 1980s, 
But ultimately, using a system like this to achieve destructive impacts against all but the most vulnerable devices was probably a non-starter just because there was no way to generate the power levels required, or at least there was no sane way to do so. However, this was the Cold War and insane solutions were still very much on the table. In the United States, Project Excalibur aimed to develop a laser that would be suitable for ballistic missile defence. Basically a system you could put up into orbit and then use to shoot down Soviet nukes before they could make it to the US. As for how to power the thing, the concept was to use a nuclear pumped laser, where you would wrap a number of X-ray lasers around a nuclear device, detonate it, in the very, very short moments before those lasers were vaporised, they would focus the generated X-ray energy into an X-ray laser beam, and that, if properly aimed, would destroy the Soviet missiles. In the end, neither this system or anything like it were ever actually built and deployed, and after the Cold War ended, both Doomsday and Counter-Doomsday weapons went out of style for a while, and as far as we know, no nuclear-pumped laser systems have ever reached an operational deployment. Instead, in the 90s and 2000s, we saw a number of much more grounded, directed energy weapons programs. The US Air Force stuck a laser turret on the front of a 747-400 and tested its potential usefulness as an anti-ballistic missile platform, only to eventually conclude that it probably wasn't practical to have a 747 circling above North Korean nuclear missile launch sites 24-7 just in case they fired one off, with the Air Force then retiring the single prototype in September 2014. In a way, the YAL-1 stands as a pretty good example for what directed energy weapons development often looked like during this time. While advancing technology was hugely beneficial for things like electronic warfare or sensors, making the jump up to a destructive directed energy weapon system that was actually practically deployable was always an idea that seemed all of promise, but always a couple of years away. At least with one or two small-scale exceptions that we might talk about later. But jump forward to 2024, and interest and investment in these systems is much, much higher. With multiple countries pursuing programs and some basic systems already on operational deployment. And while a lot has gone into shaping that change, two macro factors stand out. Firstly, the systems are just becoming more feasible to build, as the technology available is catching up to the theory. And secondly, there's arguably a growing need. Future battlefields look increasingly likely to be saturated with large numbers of munitions and disposable drones. Space as a warfighting domain is arguably growing in importance, and people appear to be slowly coming to the conclusion that shooting patriots at hobby drones is probably not a long-term solution. Which brings us, I think, to the what and why of directed energy weapons in the 21st century. And here I've got a couple of basic questions. What are the performance characteristics that might make you want a directed energy weapon? What are some of the targets you might shoot them at? And as a result, what sort of military role might they play? In terms of basic fundamental characteristics, there's a few things that both lasers and microwaves might offer you. Firstly, while you may be stuck putting a lot of money into research, development, construction and fielding, if the system in question is simply electrically powered, then your cost per firing is probably going to be very, very low compared to something like a missile. Firing a missile to intercept a target might cost everything from tens of thousands of dollars at the low end to multiple millions at the top end but generating enough electricity to fire a laser weapon once might cost less than the hourly rate of the guy operating the system. Obviously, exactly how much power you need and whether you're generating it using a diesel generator or a ship's nuclear reactors probably matters a great deal to that equation, but when you're dealing with literally multiple orders of magnitude difference between the directed energy system and the missile option, a few bucks here and there isn't really going to change the calculus that much. A new Lamborghini is going to cost more than a bicycle, even if you get the Lambo 50% off. Advantage to is precision and time to target. All else being equal, when you choose to engage a target, you'd probably prefer to hit it sooner rather than later. And at the ranges at which laser and microwave weapons can currently operate, the time from firing to you either missing or hitting the target is basically zero. Third, as long as you can manage heat and keep feeding energy to a system, usually you're not in any danger of running out of ammo. A missile system can continue intercepting targets until the tube is empty. Barring a technical failure, however, a high-powered laser is going to start blasting and keep blasting as long as you can feed it power, dump the heat, and there are targets in the sky. There's a German high-energy laser demonstration system, for example, which is reportedly capable of destroying a light drone if it can hold a beam on it for two to three seconds, and it can reportedly continue to make those engagements at a rate of six per minute as long as the system can be kept online. All of these traits, provided the weapon systems can be made to work, of course, might help answer two problems that we've seen forces around the world, including in conflicts like Ukraine encounter. The first is simply not having enough munitions available to deal with every missile, every drone, every artillery shell or other incoming target on the battlefield. And the second is the often exorbitant cost of engaging those targets using existing missile systems. Ukraine can, for example, shoot down all armed drones with book missiles, and in extreme cases it has had to do so. 
but you're going to run out of missiles before they run out of drones, and the missile costs considerably more than the target does. If you are using a laser to engage that target, however, the situation reverses. They're probably going to run out of drones long before you run out of electricity, and as cheap as drones have been getting, I'm not aware of anyone who's been able to make them for 20 bucks a piece yet. So, then in terms of military role, there's a whole range of targets you might potentially want to shoot a directed energy weapon at. These range from relatively soft and easy to destroy targets, like cheap drones or potentially personnel, up through artillery shells, cruise missiles, space assets, aircraft, ballistic missiles, or even armoured vehicles. Some of these are obviously much harder targets, figuratively or literally, for the sort of weapons involved. Using a laser to burn through a plastic Alibaba drone is one thing. Try to achieve the same effect against an armoured vehicle, however, and you'll find it's hopelessly impractical given the existing power level of these weapons. Also note that some targets are going to be much more resistant to lasers, microwaves, or both. A dumb system that doesn't contain any electronics isn't going to be vulnerable to a microwave attack. But the electronics in another target might be very vulnerable to microwaves, even if the target itself is pretty well protected against laser attack. In terms of the actual impact something like a laser can have on a target, that's going to depend on a number of factors. Firstly, target type, for obvious reasons. Secondly, range and conditions, with most current laser weapons having ranges only in the hundreds of metres or low single-digit kilometres, at least where the goal is to transmit a useful amount of energy. And other elements, including perhaps most importantly, the power of the laser. Scaling output is perhaps one of the most important engineering challenges when it comes to building a useful, destructive laser weapon. Because while you might have a useful dazzler at 30 kilowatts, and be able to destroy small drones at relatively short distances at 60 kilowatts, at least if you can hold the beam on the target, working against targets like cruise and ballistic missiles at useful distances is probably going to require a weapon in the multi-hundred kilowatt or even megawatt range. And since output is a key indicator of what you can damage, how quickly, at what distance, more is almost always better. This is why in the US, for example, you have the High Energy Laser Scaling Initiative, which isn't intended to produce a final design, a deployable laser system, but instead to test and develop different ways to solve that fundamental scaling problem. With the initially announced target back in 2020 being a 300 kilowatt system, with different contractors trying to do so using different technologies, and an eventual intention to scale that to 500 kilowatts. In terms of the effect a microwave weapon might have, the usual concerns around power and output apply, but you also have complicating, potentially intelligence-driven factors. For example, knowing what frequencies opposition equipment might be vulnerable to, might be pretty useful if you want to launch an effective narrowband attack against it, efficiently dumping a whole bunch of energy into those electronics and ruining tech support's day. Okay, so now let's start to move beyond theory into potential application. Starting with ground-based applications, asking the question, who do we know is developing directed energy weapons and why? The advantages to deploying directed energy weapons on the ground really depend on whether you want the system to be mobile or not. If you don't want the system to be able to move, this is probably the easiest place to put one of these systems. You can use fixed generators or a power grid, bulky equipment, and things like the weight and heat concerns that we'll discuss with some of the other platforms probably don't matter as much. But as we're about to see, a lot of the systems in development are intended for force or base protection. They need to be mobile. And as a result, a lot of directed energy weapons in this category need to not just be powerful enough to do their job, they need to be compact enough to be suitable for transport. A lot of the focus here seems to be about giving both manoeuvre forces and installations a better way of defending themselves against a whole suite of threats that have shown themselves to be particularly dangerous in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria and Ukraine. Drones and loitering munitions, and to an extent, unguided artillery and rocket projectiles. There are currently some solutions to these problems, but they tend to suffer from the same drawbacks we've discussed earlier. Great expense if you're talking about using missiles to shoot down FPVs or lancets and issues like range, magazine size, and responsiveness if you're talking about things like self-propelled anti-aircraft guns or the CRAM you see on the right there. The reality seems to be that the modern battlefield is more transparent with cheap and affordable precision everywhere, and so militaries might look to directed energy for an affordable counter to affordable precision that means you can still effectively manoeuvre or concentrate without putting the entire force at undue risk. The US Army is believed to have at least two programs aimed at solving that problem. The Directed Energy Manoeuvre Short Range Air Defense System, or DEM Shorad, is the component aimed at protecting the Army's combat brigades. Basically, the idea here seems to have been to take a 50 kilowatt laser and all of its supporting power source and equipment, strap that to a striker, and test that as a short range air defense system. There was reportedly a shoot off between prototypes back in 2021. Two prototypes entered, one remained standing in the end, and subsequent tests would follow in 2022 and 2023. According to a press release by the manufacturer, 
During those tests, the prototype, quote, acquired, tracked, targeted, and defeated multiple mortar rounds and successfully accomplished multiple tests simulating real-world scenarios, end quote. While it would probably be pretty convenient to roll around a system that can literally shoot artillery and mortar rounds out of the sky before they impact you, especially if that kind of system could be adapted to also target things like FPVs or loitering munitions that would otherwise be prime candidates for destroying such a vehicle, we don't have detailed public data on its performance and capabilities, and the program is still very much in the prototype stage. Another example would be the US Air Force's high-energy laser weapon system, which is literally represented as a laser weapon mounted on the back of a Polaris all-terrain vehicle, and is reportedly capable of engaging drone targets out to distances of 3 kilometers. One report I found indicated that it could fire dozens of shots on a single charge, or an indefinite number, if you could keep it fed with an external generator. The other program slash use case is a larger system intended to protect fixed or semi-fixed locations, with the trade-off that whatever you field is going to be larger and less mobile in exchange for having a lot more power, in this case 300 kilowatts as opposed to 50 kilowatts reportedly, and with that extra power, not just the ability to engage things like mortars or drones, but also targets like cruise missiles. A decent example here would be the US Army's indirect fire protection capability high energy laser, or if you don't want to use that mouthful, the Valkyrie. The system is still likely to be vehicle mobile, just not suitable for the forward edge of the battle area. Presumably in part because cutting armor weight tends to allow you a lot more everything else weight. Unlike Dem Shorad, however, we've seen a lot less of Valkyrie. And a report I found indicated that four Valkyrie prototypes will be delivered in fiscal year 2025. Moving to Israel then, we have the Iron Beam system. As most of you probably already know, Israel has a multi-layered air defense system, ranging from things like Arrow providing anti-ballistic missile defense all the way down to Iron Dome. Iron Beam is intended to be an even shorter range, even cheaper alternative for engaging things like basic mortar, rocket, and artillery projectiles, with a claimed range of around 7 kilometers. Israel might value that sort of capability because even though Iron Dome interceptor missiles are some of the cheapest in the world, you're still talking about potentially firing rockets worth tens of thousands of dollars to bring down projectiles that might cost a hundred bucks each. Iron Beam has been described as a 100 kilowatt system in terms of power level, and while full-scale deployment is reportedly still a number of years away, we have seen the system tested, and it's believed a navalized variant is also in development. The UK also has its own military ground-based high-energy laser program, Dragonfire, which was recently reportedly tested against a small drone and is described as being a long-range line-of-sight system. That last bit of information does feel a little bit redundant, as to my knowledge, no one has yet found a good way to bend a laser beam in combat. Germany is also arguably a pretty active participant in the military laser technology race. Their contributions include a naval system that we'll talk about a bit more later, but also a much smaller laser system intended for use by infantry or unmanned ground vehicles. These include an infantry portable system that's been tested against targets like doorknobs and wire mesh fences at ranges between 25 and 400 meters, a slightly more powerful 5 kilowatt system that you might be able to place on an unmanned ground vehicle, and plans for a vehicle vehicle integrated system in the 60 kilowatt range. But all of that has to do with laser systems. What about high powered microwaves? And here I want to start by talking about the American Tactical High Power Microwave Operational Responder, or THOR, which is a really fancy name for a system that basically looks like a really powerful emitter put on top of a shipping container. The concept behind Thor appears to be to create a weapon system capable of dealing with swarms of drones attacking fixed installations. In that respect, it may have an advantage over high energy lasers because instead of picking off one drone at a time, a high powered microwave weapon can instead pick a segment of sky and decide it doesn't want things there to work anymore. As a ground based system, it is obviously being developed by the US Air Force, but hey, it's deployable inside a C 130, so I guess that counts. Based on the information available, Thor's a bit of a weird one when it comes to military projects. It reportedly only cost 18 million US dollars to develop, has been tested, apparently works against its intended target, which was a swarm of drones, involved close collaboration between the Air Force Research Laboratory and other parts of the military, namely the Army's Rapid Capability and Critical Technologies Office and the Joint Counter UAS Office, and after successfully completing its two-year test period, has informed a follow-on effort called Mjolnir. So yeah, military development program involving next generation technology, significant cooperation across the Defense Force, delivered relatively cheaply, tested effectively against its intended target, and leading on to a valuable follow-on effort. So forget Thor and Mjolnir, if there's a third version, I nominate the name Unicorn. Instead, when looking at a third program intended to deliver a longer-ranged microwave weapon, instead the system got the name the Counter-Electronic High Power Microwave Extended Range Air Base Defense System, or Chimera. And while we know comparatively little about Chimera compared to Thor, we do know it reportedly recently completed a three-week field test at White Sands Missile Range, 
and that the Air Force Research Laboratory is reportedly cooperating with the Naval Surface Warfare Center on the program. And so while it may be called an air-based defense system, I wouldn't rule out the technology or development effort feeding into navally-focused efforts at some point in the future. And if none of the Air Force programs work or are suitable for requirements, don't worry, there's apparently some taxpayer-funded redundancy going on with the US Army's own containerized counter-swarm drone microwave weapon system. The Army apparently intends to operate the microwave system alongside the Valkyrie laser weapon as part of a layered defense system for fixed and semi-fixed sites. That makes a degree of sense, as you would expect, all else being equal, a microwave system to have more potential against certain drone swarms, but to be absolutely useless against targets like mortar rounds, which can be handled by the high-energy laser. The target date for the first four Army prototypes is the fourth quarter of fiscal 2024, so as long as the program remains on track, it may not be that long until we see the system being demonstrated. Okay, so let's move on then to some potential naval applications and programs. In some ways, 2024 is a bad year to be a surface ship. The battlefield is more transparent than ever, it's kind of hard to camouflage a ship on the open ocean, and surface warships face both new generations of old threats like anti-ship cruise missiles, as well as new and rapidly evolving threats like naval drones, anti-ship ballistic missiles, and even, as we've seen in the Red Sea, potentially the use of cheap and affordable drones in the anti-shipping role. Now, the good news for warships is that in some ways, their defences are better than they have ever been. Sensors and electronic warfare equipment has improved, defensive missile systems have improved, and in many designs, the shift from arm-based to vertical launch systems for defensive missiles means it might now be harder to saturate a warship's defences than it was in the old days. With arm-based launches, a ship could only fire as quickly as the system could reload. But with a VLS system where each cell can be popped individually, if the weapon system's operators get a bit twitchy, they can create a pretty spectacular fireworks and contrail show at the expense of emptying the ship's munitions pretty damn quickly. Magazine depth for a lot of surface warships is a much more serious issue than how quickly they can actually fire the missiles they have. And what we've seen with some vessels operating against the Houthi missile and drone threat like USS Kearney is that their ability to stay on station and sustain those sort of deployments can be limited by the need to go and reload. Another issue that flows from relying on missiles for defense and both a blessing and curse of the VLS system is that the same Mark 41 VLS cell that you can pack full of surface-to-air missiles is also capable of carrying a lot of the missiles that act as your ship's offensive firepower. Cruise missiles for attacking surface or ground targets, anti-submarine weapons, or maybe dedicated interceptor missiles that aren't intended to protect the fleet, but rather to shoot down potential nuclear weapons headed towards the homeland. And so when decision makers are deciding how to provision a warship before it goes on a patrol, they have to make a decision around what munitions are being loaded. If you increase the number of interceptors to ensure the ship is more capable of defending itself against drone and missile attack, you're probably also taking away from its offensive firepower, which might be why you're sending the ship in the first place. So all else being equal, if you change nothing else about the design of many warships, if fleets could rely more on directed energy weapons to defend against threats, then the result of adding those very defensive systems might be an increase in the offensive firepower of the fleet. Because now you might be able to pack more of those cells with missiles designed to make the opponent explode, rather than prevent you and your allies exploding. Plus, ships might just have some basic engineering advantages over, for example, airborne platforms when it comes to deploying directed energy weapons. In terms of some of the elements you need to get a really good energy weapons integration onto a platform, Rear Admiral Fred Pyle is quoted as saying that it takes space, weight, power, and cooling. Now, he was reportedly bringing those up in the context of challenges to integrating these weapons onto current surface combatants. But if you want to compare it to a system that has to be integrated onto a truck or tank chassis or an aircraft, a warship might end up having advantages across all those categories. In terms of weight, it's usually much easier to float mass than to fly it. You probably have more volume allowance on a several hundred meter long vessel than you do on a truck. You can get a lot more power out of a serious naval diesel or nuclear reactor than you are out of an aircraft power plant. And in terms of cooling challenges, those can always be complicated, but having more mass and volume allowance available to allocate to that problem is probably going to help, as would potentially the ability to dump waste heat into some other medium like cooling water. An aircraft might struggle with cooling water availability, a warship probably won't, unless it intends to tax the thermal storage capacity of the entire ocean. The interesting extension here is that while the directed energy weapons technology itself isn't fully mature, and most of the systems that are currently out there are technology demonstrators or development vehicles rather than intended to become operational weapons, many navies do seem to be hedging against their potential future availability in designing their current and next generation warships. And one of the biggest ways to do that is to design them to be able to produce far more electricity than their current subsystems actually need. 
And in terms of generation capacity, America's next-generation aircraft carriers are probably near the top of the list. The new Ford class can reportedly generate nearly three times as much electrical power as the Nimitz class before it. In part, that's for the new electromagnetic catapults and other advanced systems. But a lot of it, as with the excess generative capacity on Zumwalt, is just future-proofing. Navies don't need to know what's going to suck up that power in the future, be it next-generation sensors, lasers, microwaves, offensive systems like railguns, whatever. All they need to know is that something might want access to that power in the future, and when individual warships can stay in service for literal decades, it's probably easier to just build the capacity in now, as opposed to trying to rip the ship open and make modifications later. The other interesting observation here is that while it suggests that short-ranged or low-powered directed energy weapons might be suitable for deployment on a wide array of platforms, you might even put them on small unmanned systems, for example. If your new intended system is very, very power demanding, it might have to go on a larger platform, which might protect the place of some of those larger units in the force structure, even when navies might be looking at the potential of dispersing firepower and capability across multiple platforms in order to reduce the risk of very powerful, very capable offensive systems. In terms of how you go about planning to integrate a technology that, in operational terms, doesn't really exist yet, you can see some of the US Navy's thinking represented on the right there in the fabulous format of DoD PowerPoint. And what that basically shows you is a family of systems and technology efforts with the general trend being towards the use of more powerful lasers over time, and the role of those lasers changing with the power level. All the way from basic dazzling systems that are already deployed, which we'll look at in a moment, up to a future excitingly named Surface Navy Laser Weapon System Increment 3, which is intended to provide the fleet with what the document describes as improved anti-ship cruise missile defense. So as we did for the ground systems then, let's walk through a couple of active systems and development efforts. We'll start with something really basic, the ANSEQ-3 Laser Weapon System, or LAWS, which is basically a prototype infrared solid-state laser that the US installed on a single ship, USS Ponce, back in 2014. Believed to be operating in the tens of kilowatt range, this is basically a short-range defensive weapon system. So think targets like small drones and speedboats at pretty close ranges. Now, the LAWS unit was operational for a number of years, but it was always intended to aid testing and development efforts, not as a finalised system for widespread deployment. Still active and deployed, however, is one of the many contenders for best acronym of the episode, the Optical Dazzler Interdictor Navy, or ODIN. Now, unlike LAWS, which was essentially a development effort, ODIN was reportedly approved in early 2017 to answer an urgent needed requirement from Pacific Command. And as of 2024, we're very confident it's been installed on at least a number of ships and will be installed on at least eight Ali Burke-class destroyers. The first system was reportedly installed on USS Dewey back in 2019, and what you're seeing there on the right there is a reported sighting on the USS Stockdale. What Odin reportedly is is a dedicated but operational dazzling system. The laser is not intended to be super high-powered and enable it to destroy targets. Instead, it's intended to provide, quote, a near-term directed energy shipboard counter ISR capability to dazzle UAS and other platforms, end quote. And some of you might be going, hey, Perun, why not just build a more powerful laser and shoot the drones down instead? That's rather more permanent than dazzling them, and that's kind of the point. Dazzling has a lot of utility, especially for operations short of war. If you're in international waters and a potentially hostile power is circling your formation with a drone, they have every right to be there. Unless they actually attack you, shooting them down might be both legally dubious and a potential path to escalation. But dazzling them? Dazzling's a very different story. Because we're not shooting a target down, we're just showing it the light on an involuntary basis. You can degrade that target's ability to gather intelligence on you without destroying the entire drone. And in terms of people complaining about it, A, it's not guaranteed that anyone will actually care. And there's a small matter of the Dazzler only working if the camera or sensors are pointed at the emitter. Meaning if the drone wasn't staring in the general direction of the fleet, then it wouldn't be dazzled. So if you admit to your ISR drone being dazzled, you're also kind of admitting that you were watching in the first place. Moving up the power levels, we've got the system that answers that Surface Navy Laser Weapon System Increment 1 requirement on the PowerPoint from earlier. This is the High Energy Laser with Integrated Optical Surveillance, or Helios. And this is a system which combines a Dazzler, like Odin, and the ability to launch damaging laser attacks with several times the power output level of laws. The Helios effort is described as wanting to rapidly field a 60 kilowatt high energy laser with potential growth up to 150 kilowatts to provide, according to the Navy's 2024 budget submission, quote, a low cost per shot capability to address anti-surface warfare and counterintelligence surveillance and reconnaissance gaps with the ability to dazzle and destroy unmanned aerial systems and defeat fast inshore attack craft. 
while integrated into the Aegis combat system on a flight to a destroyer, end quote. I'll also make my own note here, based on the experience in Ukraine, that the definition of fast inshore attack craft can probably be extended to include unmanned naval kamikaze drones. Now, there's a couple of things to unpack in all that. The first is that you're moving further towards usefully destructive power levels. Point this thing at a small drone over a sufficiently short distance, and the operator can basically choose to set the weapon to stun or kill. The second is that integration into the Aegis system solves a lot of problems in terms of how you're going to effectively target these things and efficiently utilize them alongside other elements of the fleet defenses. And indeed, there was reportedly a 2021 test where Helios was fed a challenging high-speed track from the Aegis combat system, achieved an optical track, and engaged it. Aegis is important for making sure not just that the fleet identifies threats, but that it efficiently allocates defensive resources against them. So integrating the laser into that system makes perfect sense. The final interesting note here is the choice to integrate this thing on the Flight 2A destroyers, not the Flight 3s. You would think, hey, this is a flashy new system, why not integrate it into the latest and greatest version of your destroyer? And the answer might be to go back to those basic requirements we talked about earlier, power generation. The Flight 3's got a new ANSPY-6 air and missile defense radar. That improves their ability to detect threats, but it's also pretty power hungry. To pull a quote of Rear Admiral Boxall, Director of Naval Surface Warfare, quote, we are out of Schlitz with regards to electrical power in the Flight 3 design. We use a lot of power for that SPY-6 radar, and we don't have as much extra. Which I think just brings home some of the power crunch that a lot of existing, if not next generation warships, are going to face with regards to integrating these kind of systems. And so, of course, the logical response to that power crunch is to roll out an even more powerful laser. The High Energy Laser Counter Anti-Ship Cruise Missile Program, or HELCAP, appears to be aimed at demonstrating a high-energy laser weapon capable of defeating not just small drones, speedboats, and some very angry jet skis in the Ukrainian style, but rather a much harder, more resistant target, the anti-ship cruise missile. That means both ramping the power level up again significantly, the budget bid suggests a 300-plus kilowatt laser source, as well as a range of other technical challenges, including, quote, atmospheric turbulence, automatic target identification and point selection, a precision target tracker with low jitter in high clutter conditions, which is not always as easy as it sounds, and advanced beam control along with higher powered high energy laser development. If all those problems were solved and you ended up with a system that you could put on a warship capable of intercepting anti-ship cruise missiles, it would be a massive leap in what military lasers are able to do. But even then, there are some caveats on the intended capability of the demonstrator. In some of the sources I'll list, you see reference to the ability to defeat an anti-ship cruise missile, yes, but in a crossing engagement. So we're probably not talking about one emitter providing a wide area defense for a larger force against any cruise missile attack. Instead, we're probably talking about defending the ship this system is mounted on and maybe those that are immediately proximate to it. Now, I could talk about this program more and there are other US programs we could cover, but in the interest of time, let's start having a look at other programs around the world. Because while the US probably has the largest array of publicly announced programs, we can be very confident that other countries are pushing forward efforts in this area as well. Germany's High Energy Laser Naval Demonstrator has completed more than 100 tests under various conditions. And the head of laser activities at MBDA Germany talks about the potential of laser weapons in the SeaWiz role and predicts the company having a laser-based operational weapon system from 2027 onwards. Meanwhile, on the right there, you can see something that looks very much like a Chinese equivalent to the US law system, at least in terms of rough scale and some very obvious design features that we did see on China Central Television. But, and note we're very much in the domain of rumour, reporting, and the occasional academic paper here, there is an argument to indicate that in the naval domain, China may be focusing more of its resources on something a little bit different. To quote retired Admiral James Winnefeld, writing for the US Naval Institute back in 2021, argued that, quote, While the US military continues to focus on developing lasers, railguns, and projectiles, its major competitor, China, is pursuing high-powered microwave technology with gusto and is rewarding leading researchers in this area, end quote. As discussed earlier, there's plenty of potential applications for a HPM in a naval context, not just in a low-powered counter-UAS role, the same way a lot of those laser systems are intended to be used, but also hitting potentially large formations of targets that might have, for lack of a better term, a hard shell and soft innards. The Admiral, for example, theorizes the use of HPM against formations of very fast-moving missiles that are obviously very reliant on their internal guidance systems continuing to function in order to actually hit their targets. I think one way to mentally test the potential value of these technologies would be to assume for a moment that they work, and then ask if they did work and you had them deployed now, how would they impact, for example, what we're currently seeing in the Red Sea? Because yes, you're giving the technology a lot of free kicks there by basically jumping it forward many years in its development process, 
But I also think it demonstrates what, in a potential future scenario, the technology may or may not be able to do. On one hand, systems like Hellcap and Helios would probably allow warships to defend themselves from a lot of the threats that the Houthis are firing. Anti-ship cruise missiles, cheap drones, no problem. They'd also allow potential cost-effective defence against surface threats like kamikaze drones, but there would still be gaps in coverage that other systems would probably need to fill. Unless someone has a super-secret, extremely high-powered microwave system, you probably don't have a counter to anti-ship ballistic missiles. And importantly, given range limitations, unless the warships involved are doing very close protection of civilian ships, you'd probably still see the escorts falling back on longer-range systems like missiles or naval aviation in order to shoot down incoming threats. So for very wide area protection of civilian vessels, unless you pack them into that sort of close convoy, you'd either need a new generation again with even more range and power than before, very new tactics when it came to civilian vessel and sea lane protection, or deploy lots and lots of these systems, for example, on small unmanned platforms. Okay, so moving on then to the use of directed energy in the air and space domains. Here again, most of the programs that we're publicly aware of tend to focus on similar roles. Namely, defensive systems intended to increase the survivability of future aircraft. After all, aircraft and aircrew are already significant investments for countries, sixth-generation aircraft are likely to be even more expensive, and so to get the best possible value out of those maximum investments, you're probably going to want to layer survivability features. I know we usually talk about the survivability onion in relation to armoured vehicles, but you could also apply some of the same logic here. VLO features, as well as the sensors and weapons necessary to do your own work from long distance, might prevent you being seen. If you are seen, operating at a significant standoff distance might prevent you from being targeted and engaged. But if you are engaged and a missile is flying your way, rather than just relying on electronic countermeasures or flares, what if you equip that aircraft with some sort of defensive directed energy weapon? Now yes, most of what we think we know in inverted commas about 6th generation fighters or next generation bombers is very much in the domain of rumour, conjecture or the occasional public comment. But if you remember our video on 6th generation fighters, I think there's some compelling evidence to suggest that these aircraft are going to have both more power generation capacity and better heat management features than existing designs. Some of that may just go into meeting the needs of things like next generation sensor systems. But it also might go towards powering something like an airborne laser. Back in 2020, Lockheed Martin reportedly said that they were working towards putting a laser on a tactical fighter within the next five years. A year earlier, the Air Force Research Laboratory had reported that one of their programs had reached a new milestone. That was an advanced technology demonstration program called the Self-Protect High Energy Laser Demonstrator, or SHIELD. And the milestone in question was using a ground-based surrogate for what should eventually be an airborne system being used to shoot down multiple air-launched missiles in flight. Jump forward and the suggestion is that there are multiple components going into the SHIELD effort. Lockheed Martin reportedly delivered the new Lance Laser in 2022 which is an acronym for Laser Advancements for Next Generation Compact Environments, and seems to have been focused on shrinking down the design to one more suitable for operation on an aircraft. With a Lockheed Martin executive being quoted as saying, quote, it's one-sixth the size of what we produced for the Army going back to just 2017. Add to that other components, like a beam control system reportedly being built by Northrop Grumman, and a pod subsystem to be mounted on an aircraft being built by Boeing, and while the AFRL may not have anything like an operational weapon ready for frontline use yet, it might provide something of an indicator as to where some of that thinking is going. And as always, it's probably not just the Americans in this race, with there being, for example, fragmentary reporting that the Chinese are also working on their own pod-based airborne laser system. But another way air forces are looking at using directed energy weapons is actually on the attack. Not in the sense of giving fighters another knife fight weapon to use in close-range battles with each other. That seems to very much remain the domain of dogfighting missiles for the immediate future. But rather, to hit other airborne targets, like missiles, and even targets on the ground. And in what I'd probably describe as one of the stranger weapons on this list, back in 2012 reportedly, the US tested the Counter Electronics High Powered Microwave Advanced Missile Project, or CHAMP. The basic idea here was to take a microwave emitter, put it in an old cruise missile along with a power source, and then give it a pre-programmed flight path and target list so that it could fly over enemy territory, basically zapping ground installations as it went. As I said, the system was reportedly tested and reportedly worked, demonstrating that it could knock out multiple targets over the course of a single sortie, as well as, helpfully, some of the cameras that were meant to be recording the test. The advantage to a sort of system like this is that unlike a jammer, the results are going to be longer lasting or permanent, but unlike a physical warhead, you can engage multiple targets using a single missile or drone. The program then reportedly also spawned a successor. 
The high-powered joint electromagnetic non-kinetic strike weapon, or hijanks, does lose points for not finding a way to put an eye where that E goes, but it's hard not to see the potential value of the concept. There's been some speculation, and noting it is just speculation at this point, that you might see the hijank system fitted to an extended range JASM cruise missile, which would give you a tiny stealthy platform with over a thousand miles of range, zapping away at vulnerable systems like a computer hating poltergeist. Given the difficulty we've seen even the relatively advanced Russian ground-based air defense system have dealing with storm shadow missiles and especially intercepting them short of the final stages of their approach, essentially giving a stealthy missile a ranged weapon might make interception even more difficult. Because now, hypothetically, the missile doesn't have to go all the way to the target, it could potentially do things like exploit terrain, pop up, emit, and then seek terrain cover again. And if that sounds an awful lot to you, like the US Air Force and Navy continuing to try and enforce a scissors beats rock scenario by using air power to knock out ground-based air defense systems, my half-joking response would be, no, they're not trying to counter air defense systems with air power, they're trying to counter everything with air power. And systems like hijanks might just be one part of that puzzle. I'll also make a final note here, because I did call this the aerospace section, that directed energy weapons do have potential applications both in the counter space and space-based roles. I won't dwell on this because I have done a video on anti-satellite weapons before, but suffice to say that countries like the People's Republic of China are believed to possess laser systems capable of dazzling some satellites in orbit. There are obviously limitations to what you can dazzle, for how long and how much damage you can do, but for protecting certain very sensitive sites against certain types of surveillance, dazzling might work. Although as I mentioned in my video on French defense strategy, there is some thinking out there that suggests that maybe the best way to get around the barrier that the atmosphere poses to things like lasers is simply to put the laser above the atmosphere by mounting a smaller, much lower powered version on a satellite and then employing basically a glorified laser cutter in what would presumably be some of humanity's first, admittedly very slow and very janky, space on space combats. There's absolutely no certainty that we will see combat satellites equipped with destructive directed energy weapons. And if we do, whether it will end up being France that gives the world its first space ace. So at this point, you might be thinking, hey, this sounds like technology with enormous military potential. And I mean, yeah, at this point, directed energy weapons are probably sounding pretty good to you, the same way they've sounded good to decision makers and theoreticians for literally decades at this point. Deep magazines, rapid response times, low costs, what's not to like? And so if only, if only the thinking might go, we can get those power levels up and just a few more refinements made then these things are going to take over everywhere and a whole suite of kinetic weapons are going to go the way of the horse cavalry. And I'm not entirely exaggerating when I say that's sometimes the way these weapon systems have been described. Preparing for this video, I was even able to find a number of military journals and other articles that literally referred to directed energy weapons as game changers. And if you've watched the channel for any period of time, you'll know how I feel about that particular term, to which I would add a general rule of thumb that whenever you start calling a system a potential or actual game changer, Nine times out of 10, you have probably just guaranteed that, that system or technology will not live up to expectations. Because war is big and complex, technologies aren't perfect, and asking any one system to truly move the needle is a pretty big ask. And so the first thing I wanna suggest in this section is that if lasers and high-powered microwaves look like they're gonna become more frequently employed on the modern battlefield, then I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that various competitors are gonna invest in countermeasures and defenses against those systems, rather than just clap and agree to get crushed out of respect for the technological development. And so it's possible high-tech weapons, like lasers, might encounter very high-tech problems. For example, clouds or atmospheric turbulence. Because yes, while a lot comes down to the power and type of laser involved, a lot of these systems are not fans of operating over long distances and especially through things like cloud cover. To quote from an article on the original YAL-1A attack laser, which remember was the airborne system designed to shoot down nuclear missiles, quote, while the ABL will be able to compensate for different atmospheric conditions, it cannot shoot through clouds. For that reason, the ABL will fly at 40,000 feet above the clouds and shoot missiles once they break through the undercast, if any. On cloud-free days, it would be possible to engage earlier, end quote. Now, technological advances are making laser systems better at dealing with a whole range of issues. But even the budget submission for the Hellcat program that we discussed earlier cited, quote, atmospheric turbulence, end quote, as a remaining technological challenge. So if you need a certain high standard of capability that your system will always be able to deliver and your opponent might attack during bad weather or you live in Scotland, it might be worth also including some kinetic options in your defense scheme. 
Then we start getting into the phase where we ask not what the laser can do for us, but rather what we can do to the laser. And here, if you're an engineer trying to protect your system against attack by lasers, you might have a couple of options, not all of which have direct equivalents when it comes to defending against kinetic attack, with the key to most of these being the mechanism by which a laser does damage, where the primary threat is either light if you're dealing with optics dazzling or heat if you're dealing with a destructive attack, and so you can look at solutions that might combine elements of material science, engineering slash design, and software and function. For example, let's just say I have a cruise missile and I want to protect it against a high energy laser attack. What are some of my options? Well, from a material science perspective, I could either change the materials that it's made out of or apply some sort of coating that is very good at reflecting, dispersing, or resisting a laser attack. You can obviously build very heat-resistant ceramics. Chinese researchers claim to have invented a range of potential defensive materials that can be applied to a munition. And in the worst case, even just increasing the reflectivity of a surface and then making sure no one puts their bloody fingerprints on it might actually increase survivability to at least some extent. So far as engineering solutions go, you can redesign a system to reduce vulnerability. Maybe you increase the amount of armoured and thermal protection around a vulnerable area like the fuel tank on a cruise missile. Or maybe if you're designing the sensor systems for satellites, you deploy a couple of design features that might make them less vulnerable to dazzling. Or if it's potentially relevant to your system, you take what may have been the only good piece of advice Anakin Skywalker gave in his entire life, and you try spinning. Because remember, a laser that's trying to achieve a destructive effect usually has to be held on a single target for a prolonged period. It's literally trying to melt through a target, or at least apply enough heat to something like a fuel tank that there's some sort of catastrophic failure. But if you just reprogram your missile to continuously barrel roll like it's bloody Star Fox, then that laser exposure is going to be spread over more and more surface area, meaning it's going to take more time to build up the heat necessary on any one particular location. It's probably never going to be just that simple, and those sort of design concessions always come with costs, but it would be very wrong to assume that there's nothing engineers can do to significantly increase the resistance of certain systems to laser attack. Similarly, there are other countermeasures you might want to apply to a system if you want to protect it against potential microwave attack. This time, spinning is in fact not a neat trick and won't help you, but you can redesign, shield, or harden your electronics, increase redundancy, or in extremis, even just revert to using a dumb ammunition. I also think that, especially when you're talking about the early iterations of some of these directed energy weapons, there's a basic problem that combines doctrine, technical aspects, and risk mitigation in terms of how especially the early versions of some of these systems are likely to be used in some of their intended roles. And I'm going to call this the confidence problem. Let's just say you're commanding a warship in the Red Sea and you have an incoming cruise missile threat. You're on board some weird new generation warship and so you have two options to deal with the threat. You can fire off a multi-million dollar interceptor missile that will take out the target fairly reliably at very long range, while the other option is to save the taxpayer literally millions of dollars and destroy the thing with a directed energy attack instead. The problem comes, however, if you can only really use that laser or microwave option at fairly close range. If you want to knock the missile down with your sci-fi technology, you're going to need to let it get within two kilometers, let's say, of your vessel before you can try and use that system. And if for whatever reason the energy option fails, the incoming might now be so close to your ship that you can't fall back on the missile system. There's a decision-making order problem here. Because in an ideal world, what you'd probably want to do is try the laser option first, and if the cheap option fails, then apply the expensive backup. But the range brackets actually invert that situation. And so you're asking the commander of a vessel to voluntarily not protect their ship with a system that they know will work, but is very expensive, and instead take the chance of relying on a cheaper, close-in option. Given that warships tend to be crewed by very valuable human beings, and themselves cost hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, you're probably going to want a very, very, very high level of confidence that your energy weapon will solve the problem before you as the commander or you as the navy writing the guidance are willing to say, yes, the correct move is to let the missile through to the keeper. And so practically speaking, in some usage scenarios, unless these technologies are either mounted alongside genuinely complementary alternatives that provide a backup, and slash or the range of these systems significantly improves, early versions might not be used to their full hypothetical potential because at the end of the day, crew safety is usually going to trump treasury concerns. If you're talking about Israel's iron beam, that's not going to restrict the ability of the system to act as it's described, destroying targets that are too close for the iron dome to counter. But the equivalent question to be asked in that case would be, when are you willing to let a projectile through the iron dome net in order to try and shoot it down with the beam instead? 
In short then, the argument might go that things like lasers are not super well developed as weapons yet, and with a whole bunch of countermeasures to them already on the table, maybe there's a danger of their potential utility as future weapon systems being overstated. The obvious retort to some of that is that for every countermeasure in military technology, there tends to be a countermeasure developed to that countermeasure, followed by a countermeasure to the countermeasure to the countermeasure, and so on forever. It's the continued development tit for tat that you might compare to running on a treadmill, only if you ever get off for too long, the other people in the gym beat you up, take your stuff, and post a video of the whole thing on TikTok. Ranges, reliability, and the power level of various directed energy systems have all increased significantly over the last decade or two, and will likely continue to do so. Those improvements and adaptations may in some cases be enough to overcome some of these natural and artificial barriers to directed energy effectiveness, and maybe in other cases they won't. But here's the thing, even if every countermeasure can't be countered, or every basic problem overcome fully, that may not be enough to prevent directed energy weapons being a critical element of national armaments in the future. And one of the reasons I say that, perhaps unsurprisingly, comes back to defense economics. And in that respect, there's at least two ways to think about this countermeasure problem. Firstly, and very simply, whether or not the countermeasure is sufficient to defend against your directed energy weapon. But also secondly, what is it costing them to develop and deploy that countermeasure, and how does that change their decision-making or capability? So to illustrate, let's just take an example of one of the most disruptive threats you see on the modern battlefield, the cheap FPV drone. And these things are so disruptive, not just because they have the potential to be very accurate and very dangerous, but because they can be very, very cheap. Ukraine and Russia have got the production costs of several FPV models down as low as a couple hundred dollars for a low payload version. And part of the reason, probably the only reason it can be that cheap, is because what you're using is a lot of commercial off-the-shelf components used to assemble a specialized military piece of hardware. And perhaps for each individual type of countermeasure you might throw at this thing, there's going to be some sort of answer. You start jamming my control signal, okay, I can add some GNS navigation to it and a little bit of automation so it can go to the chosen target area and engage a target itself. You start jamming or spoofing GNS, that's okay, I add inertial or some other backup navigation system. Now you're telling me you might hit this thing with a microwave weapon, okay, I can protect it against that. Or at least I can provide some degree of protection against that potentially by providing a protective casing for the electronics and hardening them. And the point that should be mounting as we go down this list is if at any point all of those defenses are present and I don't counter all of them, my investment in countermeasures to the other are sort of wasted. If I invest in protecting against most EW but still get my electronics fried by a HPM, well, I'm still not hitting the target and I spent more than I originally was going to anyway. So having protected my electronics, now I have to protect the rest of the platform from the high energy laser threat. That means that sort of very simple design you see on the right there with no armor protection is almost certainly out. And instead, I need to apply some sort of protection to the design. And while I'm at it, my drone is operating by carrying a grenade or some other munition in the open underneath the drone itself. I'm probably gonna need to protect that at this point because if the laser impacts that and holds on target, it's gonna detonate and my drone's not gonna survive and so I now might literally be adding a weapons bay or some sort of specialized munition to my FPV and wondering, do I need more lift? Do I need more battery? How am I going to deal with the weight penalty I'm paying for all this? So maybe the whole design needs to get a little bit bigger relative to the payload it delivers. And maybe, yes, at the end of all this, my new swarming drone design is capable of defending itself against some high-energy lasers, some high-powered microwaves, some electronic warfare, and then maybe delivering a payload even in a spectrum-denied environment. Maybe. But at that point, you are not talking about a $300 drone anymore. You are not talking about a hobby device taken off the shelf with a grenade slung underneath it and a couple of 3D printed components. You are talking about a heavier, more expensive, more specialized piece of technology. And for your opponent, even if you successfully defend against all of these new style countermeasures, there might still be a benefit there. Maybe for any given level of investment, you're not fielding as many drones as you would have otherwise. Maybe you can't physically build as many drones as you used to because now you're having to make all sorts of design adaptations and specialist modifications. And maybe, depending on how far they push you in this adaptation game, the gap in cost between your attacking drone swarm and a hard kill system for the defense, whether that be a smart gun system, a dumb gun system, or even a cheap missile, might not be as asymmetrical as it was before when you were basically raiding Toys R Us for weapons of war. It's hard to know the way the respective technologies and capabilities will develop and how the economics of this will evolve, 
But the key point here is that a cheap method of defence, like the laser or the microwave, doesn't need to be uncounterable in order to be effective. Defending against that countermeasure would just need to impose a sufficient cost. Plus, as we've seen in Ukraine, the Red Sea, and so many other battlefields, not everyone is going to be using the latest and greatest generations of weapon systems. A bunch of forces out there are still going to be using old Soviet junk and stuff left over from the Cold War the same way they have for decades now. And as incredible as it might seem, a lot of those systems are not going to have been designed with the idea of resisting high-energy lasers and microwaves in mind. So even if your newly installed laser system can't defend your warship against the winner of America or China's next top hypersonic missile competition, you'd probably love to roll that capability out against lower tech threats, like what you might encounter in the Red Sea. Of course, especially when you're talking about drones, that might also raise a question for potential regulation. When you're talking about imposing costs, particularly on non-state actors trying to adapt things like drone technology, you're kind of doing so on the basis that those changes, those adaptations, are things that they might have to do themselves, perhaps very inefficiently in small workshops rather than in massive mega factories. So if you're a government, what you might not want then is for the major manufacturers to start selling civilian drones with internals that have been hardened against electronic warfare or high-powered microwave attack, or designs that, coincidentally, might be somewhat laser-resistant. Unless you're in a jurisdiction which guarantees citizens the right to possess militarised drones that are resistant to jamming, there may be a policy debate to be had about keeping cheap, available, off-the-shelf designs as deliberately vulnerable as possible to the sort of defensive technologies, like microwave systems, that might potentially be used to defend public installations, like airports, or even potentially other locations. As I said, though, that's a policy, not an economics question, so I'll move on. Going back, the larger observation here might be in some usage scenarios, particularly those defensively focused ones. It might be that especially in their early iterations, directed energy weapons aren't good enough to just replace all of the existing technologies in use, but adding them to the toolkit might allow some problems to be more effectively and efficiently dealt with, while also giving opposing decision makers something to think about and a problem they probably have to solve. Building $20,000 attack drones is fine, but not if they're being shot down for 20. And if the solution is to build a $30,000 drone or to divert attacks against targets that aren't so protected, then even if the new defense systems aren't regularly splashing incoming, they are achieving something. And that might give some reinforcement to the points of those trying to keep investment flowing. In closing, however, it'd be remiss of me not to look at least some of the risks around the development of these systems and to reflect a little bit on the potential way forward. The first risk is simply related to the development process, the technical side of the problem, and whether or not the technology will actually work as intended, delivering the results promised at the cost required. There is an old joke related to fusion power that I've heard applied to laser weapons as well. With the saying basically going, lasers are the weapons of the future and will always be so. And one of the reasons people say that is because we have been promised effective battlefield laser weapons for a very long time. Now, of course, things may have changed, and recently, a former DoD acquisition chief reportedly suggested that laser weapons may have matured enough to begin integration into operational forces. The problem is that by recently, I mean that was said in 2001. And as yet, as far as we know, even Uncle Sam is still a fair way short of fielding a Death Star. There are plenty of projections for when various deployable weapon systems might be fielded at particular power levels, but the problem with going all in on investing in them as the particular solution to a particular future problem is that there is always a risk that programs in some respect overpromise and underdeliver, potentially leaving the force disadvantaged. The flip side of that is that forces might underinvest in these systems because they've been burned in the past. I've read this described before as the cold plate effect where if you're cooking food in a pot or a plate and it's hot and a pet touches it, they'll get burned, and then, out of learned caution, they might be reluctant to touch other plates and pots in the future, even if those ones are cool. You could argue that at various points in history, a lot of money has been spent on various directed energy concepts that probably shouldn't have been spent. The question is whether or not now, against a very different technological context, how decision makers balance making sure money follows the science versus understandable risk aversion. Other potentially less logical reasons have also been advanced as to why some systems might not always receive sufficient priority. In a 2021 article, retired US Admiral James Winnefeld wrote specifically about the promise of high-powered microwave weapons for ship defense and noted a number of potential barriers to them receiving development priority, including, quote, the lack of a visible launch signature, end quote, which could act as a psychological barrier. 
which is basically him saying that watching a HBM weapon fire isn't particularly impressive, and that may literally impact people's decisions. To quote directly, Military personnel are used to hearing loud noises and smoke when a weapon fires. The only physical evidence of an HBM firing is a report that the weapon has been fired and the target was neutralized, end quote. Now, I'm not sure to what extent that actually impacts development and funding decisions, but if designers start adding giant speaker systems on top of their HBM designs that make pew-pew sounds every time the thing is discharged, then this may be why. And even if weapon systems programs themselves receive support, there's always still going to be the open question of whether a country's industrial base can actually deliver on the final design, in quantity and at cost. There is a reason that in the US Navy's budget submissions, for example, there isn't just money for the individual weapons programs, but also for the industrial base. This was included under the heading Directed Energy Components for High Energy Lasers, and that was intended to do things like support efforts to produce laser weapon beam directors, reduced lead times on things like laser weapon system optics, and improving quality and reducing production times of things like fast steering and deformable mirrors. And to an extent, if you don't start working on the infrastructure, the industrial base, the skilled workforce you're going to need before the system is ready for production, it may be that by developing it, all you really do is support other actors. After they almost inevitably get their hands on the technology you developed and construct it using the workforce and industry that they have already put in place. So yes, in a lot of militarily useful application scenarios, these are ultimately untested technologies. They have potential countermeasures, technical risks, industrial challenges, and some of the basic physical realities involved mean that the AK probably isn't going to be replaced by the LAS gun anytime soon. But at the same time, directed energy systems offer the potential to do things that missiles can't. And as the world is coming to terms with the implication of a modern battlefield that is saturated in cheap and attributable ISR assets, combined with very accessible and affordable precision, there is every incentive out there for countries to test the potential of these technologies to their limits, and, once the performance is there, to get these new generation systems into service. Leaving just a channel update to close out, I'll keep this one short because travelling always makes recording heaps of fun, so I'll just thank all of you for your continued support. Promise to reflect on the fact that we have now decisively zoomed past the 500,000 subscriber count, and promise to try and come back with a more fulsome update next week. So seriously, thank you to all of you, and of course to the video sponsor, and I will see you all again this week.